Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're doing a series of lessons on glimpses of our God, and this is number five in that series. It's entitled, The Holiness of God. I don't know if you've spent much time thinking about the holiness of God, but it's a challenge. So before we begin, let's bow our heads together and ask God to guide us. Our kind and loving Father, we know that you are far, far above us, that your sovereignty is something that awes Christians and even others. We also recognize that you ask us to call you Daddy. So help us to understand what all that is supposed to mean for our individual lives is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. As we mentioned, this lesson is about the holiness of God and what that might imply for each one of us in our relationship to Him. What does it mean, just do a Rorschach test here, what does it mean when someone says holy, or sacred, or saint, or sanctified? What do those things mean to you? You recognize that the saint and the sanctified is the, basically the, the Latin version of English holy, which has another word in Greek, but it's, it's the same Saint is someone who theoretically is holy. Set aside for purposes of God. Set aside, okay. Respected, at the very Respected. least. Respected, okay. Perfect. Perfect, hope so. It's very interesting that in books like Corinthians, for example, Paul says, to the saints in Corinth, and then he starts talking about all their sins. So I'm not sure every saint is perfect, okay. <laughs> Anybody else? What jumps in your mind when someone says holy? Swiss cheese. Swiss cheese. That's a different kind of holy. Well, it, it, it does. It always has. Every <laughs> I know they mean something else. but Holy yeah. is not necessarily a person. It can be a yeah. place or an item, Okay. such as the holy place or yes. the ark. Or the most holy place. Yes, or the exactly. ark. Exactly. Okay. Does it mean complete? Well, could mean that, but Dennis was actually the one who comes closest to what is the traditional uh, definition. A person who is holy, according to the original Greek and Hebrew, meant something, something or someone who is set apart for special purposes. That's what the original meaning of the word was. Could this person that is set apart then not be perfect at all? Like maybe Noah was set apart or... Um, it's possible. Rahab was set apart for this. Well, if, if God is holy, how can he be set apart? Well, that's one of the questions. I mean, it's set apart from whom, from what, and for what purpose? That, that's the kind of questions we need to talk about today. Well, I wonder if there's another aspect. I haven't heard it. I can't imagine when Christ was walking the earth that he looked like a derelict. No. Although Isaiah 53 says no one who looked at him was attracted to him. Sort of whatever, as a root out of dry ground, you know that passage? Well, what I'm getting at, trying to be discreet, is there are folks in the world that get around look like they haven't bathed in a lifetime. I yeah. don't think that, there's an aspect there that I like to think is not that. Yeah, no, we're not, we're not talking about that. One aspect in which is set apart, a, a creator is certainly set apart from its creation. Certainly. And so God as a creator is set apart from everything else. Now, one of the things that is basic here is the idea, is he creator? Does he exist? There was no questions about God's existence until the 18th or 19th century. And it came up at that point in time. And why, why was that? What, what's the logical reason why there was no questions about God's existence until the 18th or 19th century? The church ruled with an iron hand. Yeah, but there's a philosophical reason too. When evolution appeared. Yes, and current what does that do? But, it, but everything, everything that they, they didn't understand, they, they believed it was, came from God. Well, and there were no other explanation about origins. You, you, I, no matter what philosophical idea you had, up until the ideas of evolution started coming about, there was no other explanation for where we could have come from. You may not like God, 
but it was the only explanation of where we came from. So up until 18th or 19th century, we were stuck with that, if you, if you want to think in those terms. Now, people had very different ideas about God. People hated him. People adored him. Other people thought their whole, spent their whole lives trying to keep him happy, uh, appease his wrath, you know, all that kind of stuff. But he was there. He was an overwhelming presence. So in the Bible, which of course was written long before the 18th or 19th centuries, um, there's no real discussion about God's existence. It's just assumed. Every Bible writer sort of assumes that God is there. And he dis but there's a lot of discussion about what kind of a person God is. And you're all familiar with the passage in 1 John 4, 8 and 16, which just says God is love. Why do you suppose it doesn't say God is good or God is holy? Because those have so many different interpretations. That's a different, it would be a different interpretation. Well, people have different ways of viewing holy or yeah. good, but love is love. Nobody misunderstands what love is. Do some of the pictures of God in the Bible make you wonder if God really is love? <laughs> And, that's, and it was stated so clearly. So you yeah. would go back and say, how does God is love, what do you do with God is love, and what do you do with this story in the Bible over here? How do you put that together? Just after he drowned all but eight in the flood, would you be inclined to say he must be very loving God? I think you'd be scratching your head and saying, what do I do with these two sentences? Or even, even more troubling, suppose you were an Egyptian mother whose firstborn just got wiped out in the tenth plague. Would you say, this must be a loving God? Or a resident in a, was it an Amalekite uh, village? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or Sodom and Gomorrah, for that matter. You know, to go back to the word, God is love, is a verb, mm -hmm. and it shows God um, outwardly mm -hmm. uh, focused, where if you say God is good, God is holy, you're describing uh, an inwardly focused God with a noun. Mm -hmm. I prefer to think of God as a verb, mm -hmm. an action, an action verb. Well, it, do it doesn't mean that, just because you say God is love doesn't mean that God is serpy. No. Because he's, he's very... Just ask the ones that died in the flood. <laughs> well, that's true, but still, that, that's your definition of love. If you think that love couldn't do that, well, then you've got serpy love. Well, I'm always a little underwhelmed when people answer everything with God is love. Mm -hmm. I mean, the poets uh, and the philosophers have, have covered more pages trying to define and describe love than any other concept uh, in civilization. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a four-letter word which is nebulous, so you can spray that out there and that covers everything and you're just supposed to assume that you know what I mean or I assume that you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't work that way. You know, Mrs. White starts Patriarchs and Prophets with God is love, and she closes great controversy with God is love, and you know I've had that quoted to me, you know that that God is love. Well, when Mrs. White puts five volumes, she puts hundreds, thousands of paragraphs, and maybe millions of words, defining, describing what God's love is, mm -hmm. and if you if you pick on those uh, difficult. Uh, examples as difficult stories, the flood, uh, the, the Canaanites. Uh, one needs to have a, a careful, well thought out explanation that will appear, that will appeal to yeah. unbelievers. Back when, uh, go ahead, Jan. A comment on God is love. We are watching a grandchild being raised. Mm -hmm. And there's no question in my mind but what his mother and father love him unbelievably. Mm -hmm. When you are on the scene watching this child be raised, I now have a new understanding for the word tough love. 
<laughs> because love is tough. When you think of tough love, some of the things that you see in the Bible are much easier to put together. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. Well, going back to our um, 18th and 19th century, Voltaire became one of the great critics of the church and uh, prom proponents of everything uh, against religion. And he's co he made a comment once, if God made man in his image, then man has returned the compliment. How often do we worship a God made in our image? Mentally. Well, it's a little hard to get out of our mental box, our head, mm -hmm. and think of a being that is different, different mm -hmm. from us. Yeah. That is difficult. Yeah. So it was your question, you're, you're asking, does God just appear to be whatever you think he is? Well, uh, here's, the, here's the question. I mean, you, you don't, it doesn't take much study at all of history to realize that people have created a, a fantastic array of gods down through history. I mean, from the pagan gods, the, the gods that demand you to hand over your babies to be burned in their red-hot hands, right down through er every kind of imaginable stuff up to what we have today. See? So there's a huge array of gods. Now, obviously, those gods are not all correct, cannot possibly all be correct. So where do we get a correct picture of God? And we, of course, as Christians, we would say, oh, we get our picture of God out of the Bible, right? Christ. But not all Christians agree on what the picture of God is by any means. Well, I got uh, quite, a, quite a stir going in prayer meeting one Wednesday evening when I suggested that we, we all worship a different God. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't need to go into that, but uh, <laughs> I thought I'm going to imagine throwing erasers and shoes or whatever else. But we each have our own picture of God, yes. uh, and uh, no matter if we are identical twins going to the same schools, learn from the same Bible, uh, we will not have a perfectly similar mm -hmm. picture of God. And even if it were perfectly similar, it wouldn't necessarily be a mirror reflection or a perfect illustration of God himself. Yeah. So I, I, I see my responsibility in learning about God is to conform my picture to as, as concrete a reality as I can build from the, from the pictures, from the pixels in the Bible. And that's exactly the point. How do we try to make sure that we have as, as correct a picture of God as possible? Oh, for starters, you have to take all of it. Mm -hmm. You can't take only the piece you like. And that, of course, is the favorite thing that Christians do, I, and I count myself as a Christian. We love to go through the Bible and pick out pieces we like, and we're not sure what to do with all the rest of this, so we set it aside. But, but Ellen White describes, or I think, what, what modern theologians would call systematic theology. Mm -hmm. And that is on a particular subject, be it the wrath of God, his love, his justice, or whatever, uncover everything that is, has any application to that particular subject. Mm -hmm. Take the wrath of God. Look at everything that describes the wrath of God, or that could, could even be described as the wrath of God. You can't look just at the words, mm -hmm. but you have to look at the score, stories mm -hmm. which demonstrate God's behavior. Mm -hmm. and you put that all together, hopefully you will come up with as correct a picture of God as, 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 as can be assimilated. And, and what, if you, what do you do if you find, having done that, that there are conflicting ideas in that little piece of information. Well, then you haven't resolved the, 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 the issue. But so many of us are schizophrenic. We have this picture of God, and we have that picture of God, and we have another picture of God, and they don't shake hands at night. I mean, they, they just, just coexist mm -hmm. in our minds. I think it's important to, to remember, though, 
that the picture of God is a moving target and will be that for eternity. Because as, as I understand it, the longer we're in, in eternity, there will be new revelations and new new features and beliefs to come to understand about God mm -hmm. that we can praise and, and that's part of the of his infinite Growing. capacity is to keep providing new things throughout eternity. Yeah. One one thing concerning studying God's character. Many people when they they like certain things about God, but then they when they're when they begin studying the whole, they don't like that part that crosses their path therefore now we have a good excuse to throw out the whole thing and totally ignore it or just do the part we want mm -hmm. not say okay this is what's written in the Bible I am going to have to fit that into my life mm -hmm. even if it crosses my path so it's true. yeah it's so very true. very common what usually happens as we develop a picture that we're comfortable with, and then we go through and we judge the Bible by our picture, but instead you know, of judging our picture by the Bible, we we need to come at a, we need to come up with a picture of God ourselves. Well, I mean, personally, we have to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, what happens to a person who gets all their picture from somebody else? No, I mean that's. I mean, you can't. I mean, when you're judged. You're going to be judged on your own merits, not mm -hmm. because you, you're not going to get out of it by saying, well, this guy over here told me that. Mm -hmm. That isn't, but. Aren't we told that we're not supposed to study too deeply into God's character? Because we'll really never understand it anyway? Well, I think we should, we should not get to the place where we start just philosophizing about what we think it should be. I, I think that's a little different than studying into it if you're talking about inspired sources. Yeah. I don't think we can study the inspired sources too much, but yes, we can obviously go way far afield if we get into just philosophical ideas, well, I think God should be like this, or you think he should be like that, and somebody else thinks he should be in another way. That can be a real challenge. Well, just a minute. <laughs> yeah. You've got to... Um, if you're going to study the character of God for eternity, that means you're never going to get it anyway. I mean, you're, g you're no, going no, to always... No, that's not correct. You're never going to get all of it. You're going to peek Didn't at I it. Didn't I say you, that? You, uh, you didn't, but you should have. <laughs> I know, but um, there's always something more ahead, yeah, exactly. no matter what. So just because there's always something more ahead doesn't mean it's not worth going that direction. Oh, no, no, no. Now, one of the issues that, that comes up that we need, to be, we need to be honest about is inspiration. And you know how much that has been discussed. Mm -hmm. Because we would say, now, inspiration, without spending the rest of our time today discussing the subject of inspiration, implies, as Christians use it, that God has revealed something by means of prophets or whatever through a mechanism, maybe it's the Bible, maybe it's other things, but has revealed something to us in a form in which we can comprehend it so that now we have a picture, hopefully which has come from God, which we now understand. Now, that's, that's the implications of the word in very brief form of inspiration. Well, as soon as we start understanding it, then it's no longer perfect. Well, sure. I, I didn't say it was perfect. Anything was perfect. So, inspiration doesn't really mean it's infallible. Well, and, and let's, let's clarify that. There are many places in the Bible where we have the expression, thus saith the Lord, or, or something equivalent to that. Mm -hmm. okay? The problem is, even in those passages, what language is the Lord speaking? Okay. Do we have to know Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek in order to know what God says? Well, I hope not, because there's not too many of us around who know, who, who are fluent in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. So we're assuming that it's possible to translate that into multiple languages and still make it in a form that's reasonably understandable in all of those languages. Well, so you're coming back it, to individuals again. Even in your own language, if he's mm -hmm. talking in your own language, you're going to have 
a slightly different meaning mm -hmm. and words between different people. So I think that's why there are stories. We hear the stories of his miracles, the stories of his teaching, and they're given by more than one individual because everybody sees them from a little different perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And out of those stories and out of those, the multiplicity of sources, we, we, we are able to gain a truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, yes. Well, and if you're praying for the Holy Spirit, when you open the Word, God won't let you understand too far off from the, where the truth is. Provided you're, you're open to His yeah, guidance. of course. You have to ask for yeah. it. Yeah. But if you yeah. are asking Him to guide you, He will. Yes. He will guide you probably with the resources that you have. Mm -hmm. I mean, because if, if the Holy Spirit opened up your head, and just poured stuff into it, well, then there would be no reason to study the Bible. And you might say, what do I do with this? He yeah. has yeah. to meet you so at your level. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, now let's talk about another aspect of this, because I want to try to get as many of the points of our lesson in here as we possibly can. 1 Corinthians 10, 4 simply tells us, and maybe we can look up that real quick. 1 Corinthians 10, 4, if you look up on the screen there, it'll be uh, just below the second line there. They all ate the same spiritual bread, verse 3, and drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was Christ himself. That's my good news translation. But basically what that says is that who was leading them through the wilderness in the Old Testament? Jesus. Jesus. And Jesus himself spells that out in Luke 24, verse 44. Then he said to them, now here is Jesus speaking to his disciples after the resurrection. This is on a Sunday evening. These are the very things I told you about while I was still with you. Everything written about me in the law of, the, of Moses, the writings of the prophets and the Psalms had to come true. So what does that mean? The Old Testament, that's the, right, the law of Moses is the first five books the writings of the prophets. Now, the, the Hebrews divided their Old Testament a little different than we do now, but you, you know a major section of the Old Testament is prophets. And then the Psalms. Now, they had a third section in their scriptures called the Hagiography or, or, the, or the Psalms sometimes because Psalms was the first book in that last section. But all of what we would call the Old Testament is included there. Basically, Jesus is saying the entire Old Testament is about me. Mm -hmm. uh, could, could we... Could you clarify that? Yeah. Is, is that talking about the Messiah to come? That is, they're talking about me in the future, mm -hmm. or they talking about me leading the children of Israel at that time? The God of the Old Testament was Jesus Christ. And a lot of people aren't comfortable with that, but that's a fact, uh, according to Jesus himself. So the answer to his question is yes and yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and what that means is that the drowning in Noah's day has to be part of our picture of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And the killing of the firstborn in Egypt has to be a part of our picture of Jesus. And Sodom and Gomorrah has to be a part of our picture of Jesus. It's not, well, the Father did all that, and now we come to the New Testament, and now we have Jesus. Yes. Well, if you think it about parenting and you put it in that kind of a context, you have to punish your children. And if your children continue doing the same thing over and over, you have to keep mm -hmm. punishing them for that. Well, God, as our Father, has to punish us sometimes. And if we're not willing to, you know, give up those things that He's telling us to give up, what does He have to do but punish us? Yeah. And those that are too hard-hearted to ever um, turn back to him, unfortunately, and with, I'm sure, great uh, reluctancy, he has to destroy yeah. them, which he will have to do in the end as well. Yeah. Well, and probably in most cases, he just lets us suffer the consequences of what we have done to ourselves. And that feels like punishment. That feels like punishment. That is punishment of yeah. our own. I've heard, too, a good um, explanation for that is uh, for the ungodly who choose the things not of God um, would never be happy in the presence of God 
and therefore they are closing their own door upon their destiny. And that's not really to be blamed upon God. That is a choice. Mm -hmm. And we, being free agents, with the gift of choice that we've been mm -hmm. given, choose day after day from the pattern of life yep. that we've closed the door on our own salvation. Yeah. Jesus made every provision for everyone to be there, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Yeah. So you, you by your is. life pattern, you continue to close that door. Eventually, you uh, and you're opening out. other doors as you close right. other doors. Each right. time you make a choice, you're closing one door and opening another right. door. Yeah. Right. But the discussion has brought up two, two basic views. Mm -hmm. One is that that God has to actively get engaged and punish you for, for something that you did mm -hmm. versus an idea that sin in and of itself is bad enough mm -hmm. to destroy us. Mm -hmm. And as we get involved with sin, things happen to us that feel like punishment. And, but that is a, that doesn't require an active part on God to punish. Well, I'm talking specifically about mm. like the flood and mm -hmm. um, yeah. things that you see in the Bible where God says, I destroyed these yeah. people, I did this. You know, with Sodom and Gomorrah, he burnt that city. It wasn't just their sin yeah. that burnt the city. God burnt that city. Yeah. And so he does. I mean, yeah, a lot of our things we bring upon ourselves, our sicknesses, our um, un unhealthy ways and all of that, but he does punish sometimes. Then we come up with the concept of emergency measures. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So well, God does step in. Mm -hmm. Yes, he does. He yeah. does. You have to account for that. And to me, it helps to have at least my understanding of what God's agenda is. And if you don't have a a big picture of God's agenda, it's very hard to answer those questions. You know, mm -hmm. how does God destroy the entire world's inhabitants? How, uh, inhabitants? How, how does he how does he kill the the women, children, and the unborn? Uh, how is that a loving act? Yeah. And that's hard to explain unless you look at a big picture and understand what God's trying to accomplish. And we could uh, sp spend a whole hour just on that subject. Yeah. So I don't want to derail what you, what you have on mind. Well, but here, let's, 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 yeah, go ahead, Janine. There's, there is no action of God, I don't believe that ever comes without much warning and pleading ahead mm -hmm. of time. Yeah. 120 years, Noah preached. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the people of Jericho, they had the opportunity mm -hmm. to learn about God, and they turned their back on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Was that true of the Canaanites? Yes. They had, they had Abraham, they had Isaac, they had mm -hmm. Jacob. So they had opportunities. So they had just walked away from God and what was left. I, I want to, I, I said before, I'm going to say it again. I want to try to get in as many aspects of this holiness of God in you as we possibly can. Here's the next question. Jesus comes down on Mount Sinai. He shakes the mountain. There's a black cloud. There's lightning jumping out. The, the mountain looks like it's on fire. And the children of Israel were down there with their noses in the dirt saying, you know, don't let God speak to us again or we'll perish. And about 1,400 years later, he shows up. And these are the words that Ellen White uses to describe that experience. Our Savior awed men by his purity and elevated morality, while his love and gentle benignity inspired them with enthusiasm. The poorest and humblest were not afraid to approach him. Even little children were attracted to him. They loved to climb upon his lap and to kiss that pensive face, benignant with love. Now you have to have a picture that says, Mount Sinai and kiss the face. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it has to fit the whole thing. You can't leave either side of that, that out. And that's a challenge. Well, but there are good answers. 
Yes. Don't drop it there. <laughs> there are good answers mm -hmm. that explain God's behavior, which make him look good. But why is it so many of our friends don't like those explanations? Yeah. They like the, the, the iron fist of God. Well, I mean, you, you look at the situation. Here was a group of slaves, and the only thing they had answered to their entire lives was a whip. That's what they knew. And now you bring them out and you say, let's make a nation out of these people. Let's make us a, a sensible, reasonable government that rules by law, etc." And they're saying, we don't even know what you're talking about. And God says, okay, if whipping is what you understand, let me shake the mountain, let me scare you stiff. And they said, yeah, we understand that real well. Mm. <laughs> and there they were. Of course, it wasn't overwhelming, we know, because 40 days later, they're dancing drunk and naked around the golden fertility cult symbol. But having said that, when he comes in the New Testament, nobody recognized that he was God. Now, a few times they said, sort of parroting some of the words that he had said to them, suggesting that the Messiah, he was the Messiah and maybe he was God and so forth, but none of them, including the disciples, didn't comprehend the idea that this could be God with them until he was gone. Did Jesus have a different mission in the New Testament versus the Old Testament? Um, he had taken on human form mm -hmm. and he was to be the mirror image of God. And so he had a different goal when he took on a human image than when he was leading the children through. Well, we would be in pretty bad shape, I think, if all we had was the average person's understanding of the God of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we needed something more than that. We needed to have something we could relate to. And the children of Israel didn't manage that in the Old Testament. See, I think we get in trouble when we want to talk about, well, that was the God of the Old Testament. Maybe that's the mm -hmm. Old Testament dispensation. Mm -hmm. We have a new dispensation now. Uh, things are changed. Now, God's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And we get into trouble if we don't back up mm -hmm. and see what his over, uh, uh, overlying agenda is. Mm -hmm. And I personally believe that everything God did, Old Testament and New Testament, has been designed to win the hearts, love, admiration of us and the onlooking universe. He certainly used different techniques in the Old Testament versus the New Testament. Mm -hmm. What changed that made the new technique worthwhile? Well, if you're asking me, in the Old Testament, he was talking to, as, as Ken just pointed out, uneducated uh, slaves who, whose only education had been under the whip of, of their masters come to the New Testament. They had memorized large portions. Some may have even memorized the entire Old Testament. Yet their picture of God was so distorted mm -hmm. that they could not see God. They could not recognize God. That's why I think our picture of God is so important and how we develop it. Now, you said, you said though, that you sound like you were surprised that the people didn't, didn't figure out that Jesus was God. I, but to me, it looked like that was his effort all through his life was to tell him that he was and, God. And wouldn't you, wouldn't you think that he would be the best educator the world has ever seen? Well, and he yet he, you know, uh, uh, let me just take an example. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, I'm just thinking, you know, how would you, when, when you get, when you have your ideas about what God looks like or whatever, you know, you've got Daniel, you've got, you know, all these descriptions. Uh, they don't look human. I mean, they kind of look like a man, but there's always something, mm -hmm. something well, more than just a lowly person type of thing. Let, let me take a very concrete example. Look at Luke 18. I'm going to read from verses 31 to 34. 
Jesus is now traveling with a huge crowd of people who are on their way up from Jericho to Jerusalem on his final journey. One week after this statement, he's going to be dead. Okay? So here he is, and on that journey through that narrow canyon where the Good Samaritan experience happened, he's with his crowd, with the crowd, and he takes his disciples aside, it says, starting with verse 31, and said to them, listen, we are going to Jerusalem. I mean, duh, we're going to Jerusalem. Here we are on the road, right? And when everything, where everything the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come true. Now, we talked about people who memorized the Old Testament, so they understood this perfectly well, right? He will be handed over to the Gentiles. Is that difficult to understand? Who will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. Is there anything difficult to understand there? They will whip him and kill him, but in three, day, three days later, he will rise to life. Have I said anything difficult to understand yet? But the disciples, it says in the next verse, did not understand any of these things. The meaning of the words was hidden from them, and they did not know what Jesus was talking about. Well, it didn't fit their template. Well, that's, and that's, that's, that's precisely the problem. What do you do if it doesn't fit your template? Well, it's a little scary because that could happen to all of us. Mark Twain once said, it's not the parts of the Bible that I don't understand that bother me, it's the parts that I do. What do you suppose that, that means? And maybe it re should remind us of 1 Corinthians 13, 12, where it says, what we see now is like a dim image in a mirror, that then we shall see face to face. What I know now is only partial, then it will be complete, as complete as God's knowledge of me. And that, of course, is part of the famous 1 Corinthians 13 that hopefully we all memorized at some point in time. So we need to recognize that our best efforts are going to be still a dim image, right? So coming back to our understanding, what, what we know about God, what do we know, what does it teach us about God to think about creation, for example? You know, one, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven, and he creates the Sabbath, a time of rest. God didn't need to rest. He was taking a break. He said, I want you to gather around my children. We're going to celebrate. What does that say about God? He is love. Okay. The, the order of creation um, describes or is an example of how he runs his universe. Mm -hmm. You can't have animals surviving before you give them a place to live. It wasn't haphazard, yeah. spur of the moment, well, I think I'll just do this now. There was a plan. Mm -hmm. and I mean, he didn't make dinosaurs first and let them die off and then do something different? Exactly. And the, the point is, the, th the things that are predicted to happen in the Bible, they're not haphazard. No. They're not, oh, I think I'll go out and destroy this today or that today. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it is very much on the time frame, on the schedule, planned. Okay. So let's, let's, we're running out of time here pretty fast. Let's boil this down. What's the difference between us and God? Creator, creature, how about that? <laughs> Don't look at me like that. Aside from knowledge, a lot of a list. Yeah, it's a creator-creature relationship. Okay, creator-creature, okay. Finite, infinite. Finite, infinite, go. okay. God. How about sinless and sinners? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, any others? God is omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. Are any of us any of those things? Mm -hmm. Not at all. We're ignorant. Mortal, immortal, <laughs> yeah, self, miserable, selfless, poor, selfish. wretched, blind, naked, naked. blind. <laughs> well, the um, large uh, thing that they have going in some country is trying to duplicate how you can make something out of energy. Isn't that what it's trying to do? And God can speak, and something mm -hmm. exists. I mean, if we could speak, we would make ourselves millionaires, wouldn't we? Say, you know, we don't. We don't know exactly how He does anything how he did it. I mean, But don't you wish he had the power? Well, well sure I think there's more out. than just words, more than sound waves hitting something, making it come, come ab about. 
I mean, well, that's pretty low estimation of infinity. <laughs> well, that's true, but, <laughs> but it says he spoke and it happened. But still, still, somebody oh, could have carried it out. Yeah. Every time we put a satellite up with the latest in electronics uh, telescopes, be it radio or optical, it's further. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our minds can't really comprehend that. It's endless. Yeah. And yet it's all running to some kind of schedule. I remember the, this is years ago now, so um, even my memory of it might not be perfect, but soon after they put the Hubble up and they got the optics fixed and that yeah. kind of stuff, they, they said, well, after we've taken pictures around, we got a picture of the whole sky and so forth, they said, okay, let's look at it. Let's pick a spot where there's nothing. Yeah. There's no such thing. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they, they focused the Hubble telescope on this spot where there was nothing for about two weeks and just took a, saw, saw a picture of it for two weeks. And there were like, I don't remember the details, I think it was 17 galaxies and hundreds and hundreds of stars <laughs> in this spot where they thought there was nothing. Wow. You know? To me, I have no, no problem believing creation when yeah. you look at that. Yeah. It's just a little well, part of it. Again, I'm going to bring something else into the picture, the story of Job. What is that? It, it's a kind of a great controversy in miniature. What does that teach us about God? Remember that at the beginning of that story, what did God say about Job? He was an upright and just man. Perfect and upright, depending which translation you're, My you're looking at. My kind of guy. My kind of guy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Blameless, upright. In the end, he said, you can do whatever, but you can't kill him. Yeah. That says something there. Well, our lesson <laughs> goes to the end of that discussion in Job 42, verses 5 and 6. And it says, when it was all over, Job said, In the past I knew only what others had told me, but now I have seen you with my own eyes, talking about Job speaking to God. So I am ashamed of all I have said and repent in dust and ashes. Unfortunately, I think they stopped there because I think they needed to go on to the next two verses where God responds and he says, after the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz, now these are the so-called comforters that came to help Job, I am angry with you and your two friends because you did not speak the truth about me the way my servant Job did. Job says, whoa, he said, I, I, didn't, I couldn't even begin to describe what's happened to me with this contact with God, this interaction with God. God says, you're doing a good job for a start. You know, and he, he says God re that twice. Yeah, he, he repeats says it in that verse twice eight of Job. Yes, exactly. What's scary about Job is that an experience where you go down into the valley of suffering mm -hmm. is where you seem to learn things about God, and yeah. it's not a place that any of us or I would choose to go voluntarily. And not even into the belly of a whale. No, but the biggest blessing seems to come from letting God lead you through yeah. there and to come out. But uh, it's just not a human experience that... But isn't that true even in uh, intrapersonal relationships? Mm -hmm. Man and a wife come into conflict and they go through a time of trouble, but they hang it out, they go to God, and they work their way through it. Is not their relationship closer after having mm -hmm. gone through and worked out the issue than it was before? But and it just seems like it just seems like in was not God's love demonstrated to be made perfect when he went to the depths and was crucified? Mm -hmm. Philippians two. It, it just seems that we as humans only really learn. But you're very lucky in having a partner that walks with God, that works through those things, rather than just turn around, walk out the door, and say goodbye. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, my, the my depths is, can is go not, either way. It can go either way, but the point is, relationships are deepened and made, uh, are made better in times of stress, rather than in times of, of plenty and happiness. But Lee Strobel cannot answer the question, the theodicy. Why do we have so much suffering uh, and difficulty in this world? And it points to, to that example and say, it's because we're enriched. Because after we've been through this, 
that that's the point that uh, we become closer to God. Mm -hmm. And I, I, th that picture of God really is uncomfortable, I find uncomfortable. Who will be the people closest to God in heaven? Will it not be those who have gone through that time of trouble and have felt that they were absolutely going to be destroyed, but by faith hang on to him and the, the pain that they go through in that last time. And they are the ones who can sing the song that no one else can learn. But I have a hard time believing that God requires that experience to come close to him. That he creates, if you will, evil to put us through some sort of trial that makes us savable. Well, let me, let me put another face on that discussion. There were a number of people in the Bible who had encounters either with God directly or with angels. Mm -hmm. What was their response? What did they see? One of the classic examples is found in Ezekiel chapter 1. I'm going to start reading from verse 26. Above the dome there was something that looked like a throne made of sapphire. And sitting on the throne was a figure that looked like a human being. The figure seemed to be shining like bronze in the middle of a fire. It shone all over with a bright light that had in it all the colors of the rainbow. This was the dazzling light that shows the presence of the Lord. When I saw this, I fell face downwards on the ground. Then I heard a, vo a voice saying, Mortal man, stand up. I want to talk to you. And if you go through the Bible, you will discover that that kind of message is repeated. Genesis 28, 16 and 17, Jacob saw the ladder and understood. Uh, the children of Israel had a relationship with God at Mount Sinai, Genesis, Exodus 19 through 34, and went through some very difficult times. Daniel in captivity, as, as Ezekiel was, Daniel 10, uh, a similar response in, in several places in Daniel 10. Um, God says some interesting things about people who had special relationship with him. One of the most interesting ones is found in Numbers 12. So I sp is talking about Moses. So I speak to him, that is God saying, I speak to Moses face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He has even seen my form. How dare you speak against my servant Moses? So um, what does that teach us about God? What is... It's interesting that he always, in these experiences, he, he wants us, he doesn't want us just to grovel. He wants us to learn something. He wants us to stand up. He wants to talk to us. What's nice about God is Moses had even killed a man, mm -hmm. and God called Moses his friend. So God does not hold our past against us. It's mm -hmm. how we're progressing towards becoming friends with him that's, that's important. Yeah, Jane Ann. Picking up on God, on God's God's statement concerning Moses, and putting it together with God's statement concerning Job. Mm -hmm. In both of those statements, what God is saying, my words, is, this person understands me. Mm -hmm. This person knows who I am. It, the most valuable thing to God is that we understand what He is all about. Mm -hmm. I don't think we'll ever completely understand. No, 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 no. Everything. But the goal is to get closer, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The better we understand him, the, the, the better it is. Another experience. W w I'm, I'm trying to get as many well, of these. Is, yeah. Isn't it um, also relating to us, like when someone understands us, like we do something and someone has anticipated and, and we're, we're almost delighted that that person knows us so well that Mm -hmm. And so I can see how God wants to be known by His yeah. children. Sure. A bunch of fishermen were out in the Sea of Galilee. They had fished all night and caught nothing. Okay, all night. These are professional fishermen. They had been fishing all their lives. Caught nothing. The dawn comes and they say, well, these big heavy nets, the fish will see everything we're doing. There's no way we can catch any fish now. They're pulling into the shore. And there's Jesus walking on the shore. And of course, Jesus, they know, these are people who turned out to be his disciples. 
And Jesus calls them, and as he's calling them, he says, um, drop your nets on the shore side of your boat. Now, the boats are out deeper. The fish can see them clearly. It's daylight. They can see the nets clearly. You're in shallow water. What are the chances that you're going to catch any fish? Zero. And they pull up a catch that is so enormous that the nets are breaking. And I like this comment from Ellen White about Peter's response to that. This is Luke f comments about Luke 5, 1 to 11. And Jesus, he saw one who held all nature under his control. So that's another part of God we need to try to bring into our picture. The presence of divinity revealed his own unholiness. Love for his master, shame for his own unbelief. Because he thought, what, why are we, I mean, this is a carpenter telling fishermen how to fish. Okay? What, what does he think he's doing here, you know? For his, his own shame, for his unbelief, gratitude for the condescension of Christ, above all, the sense of his uncleanness in the presence of infinite purity overwhelmed him. While his companions were securing the contents of the net, Peter fell at the Savior's feet, exclaiming, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. That's Desire of Ages, page 246. So what did catching fish have to do with making Peter think that he was a sinful man? Well, that's basically the question. The, yes, Andrea, go ahead. In Revelation, the wicked who have chosen to, to not believe or adopt um, faith in God are going to be crying out for the rocks to fall on them. Mm -hmm. They ask for their own destruction. Yeah. And I think these Old Testament examples are perfect warnings for anybody who should follow in those same footsteps mm -hmm. in our present day and throughout all generations mm -hmm. so that we don't do what they did because ultimately the wages of sin is death. And if it's not going to be here on this earth temporarily, it is going to be eventually permanent. Something where once that fire is already quenched, mm -hmm. there will be nothing left of the sinners that have chosen. I want to follow on with what you've said because it's perfect for what we want to talk about next. Adam and Eve loved to walk with God in the garden. Mm -hmm. It was their favorite thing to do, okay? Now, people are, you, you, the people you mentioned at the end of this world's history are, God is coming back and they're crying for the rocks and the hills to fall on them. What has changed? The same thing that made Adam and Eve hide when Jesus came the next day the after their sin. Yeah. And what is that? They had broken their relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Their faith and love and trust in Him had been transferred to the creature in the tree. And they were afraid of what God was going to do. In the New Testament, Luke 4, 31 to 36, if you have a chance to look at it, it talks about the time when Jesus was in the synagogue in Capernaum, and a demon-possessed man came in and gave a wonderful testimony. Jesus, we know who you are. You are the Son of the living God. Why would the devil do that? Or was he forced to do that? Did God force him to give that testimony? Who cares? <laughs> did, he, did he want the testimony to come from a crazy man so that people would s discount it? Well, or did, they, did he want it to appear like Jesus was somehow in cahoots with the devil? Because Christ shut them up not long after that. Mm -hmm. They were starting it, and he told them to be quiet. Well, we've said that this lesson is about the holiness of God. So we now need to sort of wrap up. Look at Revelation 4. We look at verses 8 and 9. Revelation 4, verses 8 and 9. And I hope you've got your Bible and you can look at some of these verses with us. Each one of the four living creatures had six wings and they were covered with eyes inside and out. Day and night they never stopped singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. The four living creatures sing songs of glory and honor and thanks to the one who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, when they do so, and it goes on to talk about other things that happen. So uh, 
You think God would ever get tired of hearing holy, holy, holy? Yeah. Well, he tells us not to pray repeated, repeatedly. Mm -hmm. so why do you think it says holy, holy, holy instead of love, 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 or good, 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 or mm. saint, saint, saint? Ever thought about that? Well, it's a state of being. It's, okay. it's what's happening all the time. It doesn't necessarily mean that somebody is praying all the time. It's just, it's just, to me, it's symbolizing that he is that way all the time. Does God have constant communication, perfect communication with the entire universe all the time? Do you think that there's messages coming into his throne all the time that would make you want to rejoice? Not every message. I'm not saying every message. Sure. Yeah. I mean, all heaven rejoices over one sinner that repents. Exactly. Yeah, Luke tells us that, doesn't he? He says, mm -hmm. one sinner repents, heaven rejoices. Are you saying the holy, holy, holy could be their response to news coming in? Sure. So that's exactly what I think happens. So when the Lord comes and everybody's saved and everybody's not that's not saved, all that's resolved, they won't be doing that anymore. Well, I don't know what kind of messages he's getting from other parts of the universe, but I can imagine that there are things that he rejoices about that come from there as well. I don't see any reason for this to stop. The, the other thing, though, mm -hmm. the other thing is that isn't this kind of an emotional thing? Can you... Well, if can it is, you, is, that, is there something wrong with that? Well, how can you keep it up 24 hours, oh. all every minute, you know, but without... Once we see a piece of heaven, we're, and we realize our unworthiness, we're going to not want to stop worshiping Him, just like the people who were freed from any of their ailments. The first thing they wanted to do when they were healed was follow Jesus. And some, He would tell, no, stay behind, because they'd be a better witness yeah. for Him. Others were permitted to follow, and I think we will, n and I hope, never get tired yeah. of Well, I just don't understand that. I just don't understand that because everything that's uppity. We're I running out of time. I so think I'm this this could be thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. As, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we're running out of time. We, I've got to I've got to wrap it up here. I hope that you've gotten some ideas of about things that you can think about that will make you say, holy, holy, holy. See you next week.